Ladies and gentlemen, on my way in, I saw an old friend I haven't seen for quite some time. Not only is he a great, great, great guitarist, he's a fabulous entertainer and singer as well. I'd like for you to give a big hand to Mr. Mel Brown. Mel Brown was born October 7, 1939, in Jackson, Mississippi. He grew up in the small community of Rankin County, located just outside of Jackson. At the time, Mississippi was segregated. There were separate water fountains, washrooms, and restaurants. Though the racial climate was harsh, Mel's home life was full of music. His father, John Henry Bubba Brown, was a Mississippi blues man and a music teacher. There was always music in the house on the weekend when Uncle Bubba wasn't working. And he taught most of his children how to play the guitar first and then the piano. He had a very happy family life. I think the Browns were a very cool, focus-centered family and music was definitely what they were focused and centered on with his dad playing and his, his brother. And it was always, you know, you'd ask Mel, people would go, Mel, when did you first start playing? And Mel's answer was always, I can't remember when I wasn't playing, you know? So he told me he was playing a stand-up bass and he had to stand on a chair in the kitchen to like reach the bass, you know? Mel had what they called polio as a young boy and he wasn't able to get out and do things like other children and then his he told his father that he wanted to do things. So that's when his father started teaching him how to play the guitar. Well, the biggest thing that stands out in my life is getting a guitar when I was 14 years old from my dad. That's the highlight of my life. Is there anything anybody want to know? Is that a question? Mel, when your dad was picking around the house, when he was just picking, what kind of stuff was he picking? What was he playing? <laughs> Mel said there was always musicians coming through. There was musicians, they'd have a Friday or Saturday night, there'd be guys come over and his father played, so they'd set up and they'd play and they'd have, you know, have a party, I guess. And uh, that's where, you know, Mel learned how to play. And it sounds like Uncle Bubba must have been a very <laughs> smart man to get his family together mm -hmm. and to do this in the context of the home as, as opposed to, uh, 
having them, I guess, as young children in a, in a juke joint. You know what I mean? So uh, that's interesting to me that he, you know, was training his, his family to do it. And uh, in the context of Mississippi, I'm sure the conditions were, the racial conditions were very harsh. And that, I just saw it, I see it now as a, a, a way of, of release. <laughs> When Mel was 16, he moved to Los Angeles to pursue a music career. He was keen, he, he wanted to get out of there. He loved Mississippi, but he saw a bigger world, you know, and I think he saw music as this key to a bigger world. And I know he went to Los Angeles when he was about uh, 16 or 17. I know in the early 60s, he went to California, thought he was good, got his ass kicked came back home, practice a whole lot more. You know, certain guys get to a step, and looking at that next step's a big one. They get so good, and then locally they're good, and they settle for that. But Mel knew that to be any, any good anywhere, especially in California at the time, you're gonna have to get real good. And so he spent a year back in Mississippi, playing all the time, and then he really bumped up what he could do, and then he went back to L.A., and he immediately started working with bands and he never looked back. I think he was playing with Johnny Otis, who had a big hit called The Hand Jive in the late 50s. He had the biggest radio, black radio show in the United States at the time. I don't know if it was out of LA or out of uh, Jackson, but Mel was, became a sideman in that organization on the radio program. And then he went to L.A. where he told me he played, uh, he played some jazz sessions until he did, uh, I think it was Nancy Wilson's, a session for Nancy Wilson in which Howard Roberts was the second guitar player. And uh, Mel said that Howard kicked his ass hard and he went back to Jackson and learned all his, I went back and learned all my chords, Leo. So uh, he had uh, a taste, then he went back to L.A. and I know that we talked about some of his dis discography at times. He played on hits for people like the Hollywood Argyles, like on Alley Oop, believe it or not. Well, this, this was huge, probably for uh, Oliver Nelson. I mean, that was a big album. Everyone should go out and find that record because it's, it's a great record musically. And also, at, when you look at the time, how it changed careers and everything else, a lot of times, when you have a record like this, there'd probably been two of a lot of things, horn players and everything else. There's only one guitar player on this, and that's Mel Brown. Huge record. I mean, T-Bone Walker loved him. That's who, that's who discovered Mel. Mel was working, but Mel was in, the, uh, in Los Angeles in the 1960s, and there was a club there. T-Bone Walker came in for a week, and this is 1967, and he's so impressed. I mean, this is the guy that really invented modern you know, with all due respect to B.B. B.B. King would probably tell you the same thing. It was T-Bone Walker. So T-Bone was so impressed by Mel's playing, he said, hey, I got to go in next week and do an album. Do you want to come in and help me and play some guitar? So imagine being asked, but like by T-Bone Walker, dude, do you want to come in and play in the session? And not only was T-Bone impressed, the record label, ABC Impulse, was, and the producer was so impressed, they immediately signed Mel to do his own... Uh, solo album, Chicken Fat, and so they did the T-Bone Walker album, and then about three days later they did Mel's first album. So he went from being, you know, a backing musician, a band leader, to being like a recording artist with two major releases out in a span of about a week. So Mel was probably the, the go-to phone guy, you know, first guitar. Not that he made any money out of it though, you know. He told me once, he was at a session, I don't know whose session it was, and he says, uh, am I gonna get paid for this? And everyone had left except the engineer, and he goes, not likely. <laughs> and he goes, oh, okay, he says, well, as he walked out the door, he picked up two brand new Fender Twins, he said, I'll see you later, and just walked out, because he figured, oh, this will be good payment. The engineer said, I didn't see anything. <laughs> Mel was signed to Impulse Records and released Chicken Fat. Things clicked and the albums and gigs rolled in. You know, I, I've heard musicians say, wow, when I heard, 
you know, Mel's Chicken Fat. That was the most amazing album and it influenced me. You know, and to a lot of people, they wouldn't even know that album, but to a lot of guitar players, he was like the thing. Uh, Mel had an album called, I think it was Chicken Fat. And all of us uh, young guys, you know, um, we all wanted to, you know, to, to be able to say, well, first, who in the heck's that guy? And, and then, you know, once we did a, a little research, we, none of us knew that Mel had the history that he had. He was getting pretty heavy by this time. This came out in 67. Well, recorded in 67. But when you look at the guys like Herb Ellis on it, you know, they're, they're, Herb Ellis wouldn't be on some, some rookie's record, you know. So th this was some serious, serious playing. So for Mel, from when we talk early 60s, late 50s, to get to a point like this in 67, that's, that's some serious learning. There's guys that would go a lifetime never get that close. Yeah, fantastic right? After recording Chicken Fat, Mel Brown played with the top artists of the time. In the 1970s, Mel hit the road with Bobby Blue Bland. He was famous for being the guitar player with Bobby Bland. I'm guessing he started with him probably uh, like 70, 71. Bobby Bland also had another guitar player that was equally as talented, Wayne Bennett, who played a lot with Mel. And um, between the two of them, there were legends in that, that Bobby Bland was a big name blues artist. One of the early artists, you know, maybe after B.B. King, they got around to playing Vegas and Reno and big shows in New York and things like that. And I could uh, be playing with Mel and he would hit a note. And I, I had something to say different from what normally I would say. You know, because it fit right in, you know. I could hear, I could hear what he was playing, you know, the story part, you know. And it gave me something good to, to add live and uh, when there were no lyrics, you know. Yeah. And he was just, uh, uh, I can't say enough about him, you know. The summer of 1975, that's the summer I met Mr. Mel Brown. There come Mr. Brown off the bus. And he's just looking and looking and staring at me, and, and I'm looking at him like, well, you know, what's your problem, dude? And he's like, don't I know you? Please. That's the oldest line in the book. I know, well, you can come up with something better. <laughs> and then he goes, no, 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 I'm serious. You look like this girl I know. I said, you're right. I didn't believe him for a second. And so he said he was part of the band because I asked him who he was. He said he was part of the band and I said, what do you play? It's a guitar. And he said, but now don't you laugh at me when I'm playing. And I'm like, yeah, okay, sure. I won't laugh. 
And all of a sudden they started and Mel Brown started playing that guitar and he was unbelievable. He asked me to have a glass of wine or something with him at the, in his room after. So I said, okay, you know, school was out for summer. I had nothing to do but party, right? And so we hung out together. I went to see the shows at night and he took me places and we went around places. And I was gonna go to Mississippi. But then he asked me if I wanted to go with him. I said, where are you going? He said, Texas. They were doing a tour of Texas. They're going to Texas to like to go. I said, sure, why not? Nothing else to do. Might as well go to Texas. I've never been to Texas anyway, so. We went to Texas. And then we went to uh, Memphis, which is where Bobby is from, Memphis, Tennessee. And Mel went to Nashville, and we got a place in Nashville. In 1975, Mel John Willie Nelson and Waylon Jennings as a session player and helped create the Outlaw Sound. Well, that's what Mel told me. He says Willie came up with the idea of calling up the Outlaws album because Mel was the only black guy that was on the album and playing country at the time, which was a big deal. Like, we're talking 40 years ago that Mel was playing in a country band, so. But Mel told me that uh, Willie had uh, called it the whole Outlaw album because of Mel being on the country album, so whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it fit in pretty good. In 1982, Mel anchored the house band at Antone's Nightclub, home of the blues in Austin, Texas. It was probably a Blue Monday, probably during one of the Antone's anniversaries, because that was the time at which everybody would come, that was every living blues legend would come to Antone's and play. So it might be Eddie Taylor and uh, Jimmy Rogers and Hubert Sumlin and Pine Top and uh, Lazy Lester and um, the Rhythm Section Fuzz and, and uh, Willie Big Eyes Smith and everybody was there. And I remember Mel being there at one of those. And then he came back and then he stayed for a while, which was our once again, a gift to us. And Mel would be playing piano, organ, and then just as an afterthought, he'd pick up the guitar, and literally all the guitar players would just be sitting there with their mouth open, because um, Mel is, he's one of those guys that can play jazz, blues, country, all equally as well. You know, Mel's a control player. It's not a lot of wasted notes, it's not a lot, he doesn't play for, to impress. You know, he, he play in, in, but boy, <laughs> I mean, you know, when, when we'd have those jam sessions at Antone's, all the great guitar players, you know, Jimmy Vaughn, and just Alan Haynes, Stevie Ray Vaughn, W.C. Clark, and that. But when, when Mel strapped that guitar on, I, I guarantee you, everybody would listen, and we wanted him to play more. <laughs> Mel was the utility man, as I said. You know, be on, on piano one night, on guitar another, singing. You know, that wonderful smile, just being um, the guy who, in many ways, legitimized our blues credentials. One of my favorite groups. Um, that really didn't get the recognition and accolades was the Silent Partners. Because I know all three of those guys. And all of them came out of major. Tony Coleman, out of BB's band, Bobby Bland. Russell Jackson, out of, of BB's band, and Mel. And, and I, I just loved that, 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 that band and I, I wish they had, you know, had the, um, the uh, opportunity to stay together. Oh God, that band was very strong. Those guys were all um, headliners, essentially. They all had the ability to lead a band, to um, in, on any given night star, uh, be the star of the show, as vocalists, as players. And uh, but of course, Mel was the the rooster. He was the the guy. And it was his band, no mistake. 
Well, the first time I was in Antones, and I remember, I remember the moment specifically, he was up on stage playing, and I was probably, somebody overserved me again one more time. And I was sitting at the bar, and it was the end of the night, and there'd been a lot of music going on on the stage that night, and we were getting up to leave. So this would be whatever, two, three o'clock. And uh, I heard this guy, the lights were up, and this guy was standing on the edge of the stage, and I remember his toes were sticking, and he was just playing, staring at the ceiling. The night was over, but he was ushering people out, and it was Mel Brown, and before I got to the front door, I remember turning around and saying, who's that guy? And it was Mel, and that was just back and talking to him. And that's where it all, it all started with that moment. And if he wouldn't have been playing there that night, maybe I, you never know what might have or might not have happened, but it was magic. The guy was just playing his heart out as people were drifting out the door at the end of the night, so it was great. What I want to know is, what would possess you to move from Austin, Texas oh, to God. Kitchener? Oh, that's a good question. I'd like to snow. <laughs> oh. I like the cold weather. No, I met some people in uh, Kitchener. Glenn Smith. Yeah, he's, uh, he's back there. He's the owner of Pop the Gator. And all the people around him are real nice. You know, I hadn't found the place that I would like so many people at one time. So that's why I moved to Kitchener. Plus, I love Canada, you know. In 1989, Glenn Smith traveled to Austin, Texas to ask Mel Brown to anchor Pop the Gator's house band. I remember we had a rental car and he told us where he lived and went to his house. And when he came out, he told me to move over. He was, I was no longer driving, Mel was now driving the rental car. And uh, he, he says, uh, that's one of the times we w ended up going out to uh, Willie, Nelson, Willie Nelson's golf course where he was holding a tournament. I remember it was to beautify Texas highways. All of Willie's band were there, and, he's, and Willie's had the same band forever. And as we pulled up, the, as you go into Willie, Willie's driveway, there's signs, you know, unless you're invited, turn around now. And as you get closer, the signs get bigger and more threatening. It's like, you're not wanted, go away. And I said to Mel, is this cool? He's driving. So he goes, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. And when you pull into Willie's, all his tour buses are all beside each other, the honeysuckle rows, and, and you can just see the legend starting. And we're walking up this small knoll, going towards Willie's band standing there, and they're selling Lone Star beers for a dollar out of a bathtub, and all the money's going in the jar for to beautify Texas highways. And they're going, hey Mel, how's it going? And they looked at me, I'm like, I'm with him. You know? <laughs> but I remember we were out there, and uh, I just said to him, you know, I, I, in the back of my mind, house band, blah, 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 want to come? And he says, okay. So that was it. You know, it was a 30 second conversation. I should say a 28 second, 28 seconds too much. It was about a two second conversation. I just said, hey man, want to move to kitchen and anchor the house band? And he goes, okay. And that was it.
In December of 1989, Mel arrived in Kitchener to anchor the house band at Pop the Gator. And I remember looking out the window and it was snowing coming down pretty hard and I, and I looked down and I saw this big old Buick pull up right into the curb where the buses are to park and out steps Mel Brown and someone ran down to get him and he walked in and he says, I'm here. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> it all started from that. I just found a down at uh, Cedar Tree, I used A35 organ, which we bought, put on the stage. So Mel had his organ, guitar, great drummer, and great bass player right off the bat. And this happened within like days of him coming. So we had a great band for him. Seeing him play that piano and then picking up a guitar and then singing, I mean, he was just a real, he was a real magic man up on that stage. Somebody said there's this really great player who's playing down at this new blues club called Pop the Gator. His name is Mel Brown. You got to go hear him. So I waited a few weeks and, and I wandered down. I believe it was the Wednesday night jam session that he used to run. And I, um, I heard him do his first song and he, he kind of eased into the song. He said, it's pretty good. And then by the end of the song, my jaw was on the floor. He had, he had just ripped the song apart. He was absolutely incredible. Here in Southern Ontario, I mean, you're talking something that's from the Deep South and you're putting it here. You know, we're, you know, Ontario and Canada has its own sound, but you're putting something from a totally different sound musically into here, you're, you're integrating into here. Uh, people are bound to notice and go, wait a minute, this is, you know, this is different.
original lineup of Mel Brown and the Home Records was Randa Coriel on drums, Leo Barasari on bass, and John Lee joined them shortly after. Leo had played bass with Bronnie Hawkins and a whole lot of people, and uh, Randall had played with Alana Miles on uh, her big album. So these guys would, were great musicians. So they started out as Mel Brown and the Home Wreckers instantly, and uh, they were. <laughs> <laughs> they were great. He was the real thing. You know, his, his demeanor was just, it was just very cool. It was uh, so relaxed. Uh, it was welcoming. And he played, the he played great grooves. And the three of us, it was just the three of us at, at first, um, just fit, fit really well together. It was just Glenn Smith calling up and saying, Hey there, Slim, we need a band for Mel. And it was just about, that was it. That's how it all started. And Leo said, ask me if I'd come and uh, check out Mel Brown. And I did. And Mel came to my house and checked me out. Uh, we ran some tunes. And then the next Wednesday, I was at Pop Together. They had a jam. You had to sign the list and get up. And you get up and do two songs. and. I didn't want to do that. I, I just wanted to sit in with the band. I kept pointing at the organ, you know. And he's looking at me and looking away, and looking at me and looking away. Finally, he says, okay. So I get up to play. And I, after I finished playing, Leo and Mel are leaning over the organ. Who are you? What are you doing here? You want to play? You want to join the band? So that's how I started playing with Mel. Frog Hollow is a little uh, natural amphitheater in Dune at the back of somebody's farm that Glenn knew and it was a perfect place to have a concert because it's like a bowl, a big grass bowl. It all started at Frog Hollow out in Dune. One summer we did it in Victoria Park and it was on the island and then we moved it downtown. see him every week, maybe a couple of times a week, uh, for years and years in town. And, uh, and I think because of that, people uh, that were drawn to the blues uh, started doing stuff about it. Started, let's, let's start a festival. I, I believe that that's how it started. But, you know, had it not been for Mel, uh, that seed wouldn't have, wouldn't have uh, germinated, that's for sure. A few folks, I was one of them, uh, got together and, and threw around some ideas about creating a blues festival uh, around some themes. At that point it was called Blues, Brews and Barbecues. And we said, well, we know who the headliner's going to be, and the headliner for the first festival is going to be Mel Brown. That's no ifs, ands, or buts. And Mel, uh, until he passed, was the only musician who graced the Kitchener Blues Festival stage each and every year. We've been able to grow that festival in this community from a one-day 3,000 attendance event to well over 100,000 folks uh, visit uh, five days over five stages. In the mid-1990s, the second lineup of Mel Brown and the Home Records was Jimmy Boudreaux, Al Richardson, Scott Urquhart, John Lee, and myself, Miss Angel. I met him at one of the blues picnics out in uh, Frog Hollow. I would have been around 1989, I guess, and, uh, and we sort of hit it off that day. He had so much groove. He could like, ah, it was weird. He could start playing something and stretch the time, you know, like that. Like if you opened a tune with like a, a just a solo thing, just melt. And you start playing, it'd be like one, two, three, four, one, two. You know, he'd push and pull, he'd squeeze it. Pull, but at the end, he'd be back in exactly the right place. His sense of the, just the, the pulse in the groove was so strong. Mel turned to Leo and said, um, you know, we need a drummer. Randall's going on the road. Who should we get? 
and Leo kindly recommended me, so I started to sub in with Mel at Pop the Gator. I, I never had any ideas about singing, you know, I was just enjoying the show. Right. Me singing was totally 100% Mel Brown's idea, not yeah. mine. Yeah. Mississippi shine, Mississippi moonshine. Woo, doggy. Nick, nick, nick. Yeah, he'd bring that stuff home. And uh, we came back from a gig one night, and uh, Mel says, Get a cup. So I ran in the house and come out. I had a big glass. He dumps it in there. Probably up to, you know, about that much. I come in, I'm zipping on it. Well, 6.30 in the morning, I woke up in the chair, holding the glass, and there might have been that much gone from it. <laughs> it was powerful stuff. To, to get that style? Who did you listen to when you were first starting to play? Well, my dad, for one, and, and everybody else that did music. I listened to everything. Huh? Well, I like, like Miles Davis, for instance, and I like B.B. King, Wes Montgomery, yeah. and my dad, and all the blues, all the blues players. Well, Mel influenced so many people in this community, influenced the audience. We uh, have a blues audience and a blues scene in this community that's probably one of the better ones in North America. And uh, you've got the, all these players, and in their playing, you can hear Mel Brown, and that's absolutely fabulous. Mel's presence in Kitchener inspired a love of the blues in many local musicians like Sean Kellerman, Steve Strongman, Julian Falk, Ian Taylor, and many others. He felt that he was a really good teacher, and that's what he does. And you think of people who had the chance to sit in with him or to, you know, just chat about music. And I, I think he prided himself in, in teaching younger players about the blues. Someone like Mel Brown just all of a sudden comes into your world. <laughs> it's a gift from heaven, you know. It, it was, and then, and like, and then for four years watching him three or four nights a week playing jazz, playing blues, it was just like, it, it was the best education I could have as a guitar player. Just the fact that somebody who, who's that amazing is actually around playing Everybody else, especially young kids like, like myself and some of the other guitarists that were around, we were like sponges. We got a chance to go and be up close and personal with a world-class musician. 
the well was never dry. Like he just kept on, it, it, he just had a deep, deep knowledge of, of music. And it wasn't just guitar, it was music. It didn't matter if it was just guitar. It was, it was keyboard, it was, it, was, it was music in general. Like he just had a, a wealth of knowledge. There's a lot of players here, but everybody will get to play tonight. You, and you, and even you, he was looking at me. I was very nervous at first, and, and, but Mel really liked it, and he said, oh, you're doing fine, baby, and he started ta uh, to dance a little bit, and then he said, do another one, and so I did another one, and then he said, you can come back anytime, so I did. As far as music is concerned, we were Mel's children. I, I really believe that. Um, he nurtured all of us in one way or another with our music. And uh, I don't think I'd have a, I don't think I'd still be playing music, especially blues music, if it wasn't for Mel. If it wasn't for Mel. I seen the influence that Mel brought on the city. You know, he, he brought all the, the music lovers, blues, uh, to, uh, blues people to come out and uh, it was like a community. He built a community from that. There was a real core group of people in this community that were really his friends and that he, he, they, they were thriving on his, his um, mentorship. They were thriving on his presence just being in the area, you know. He had the ability to work with anybody and I, I'm not sure how that happens. But he had the uh, flexibility to go into studio and work with any genre of music and, and probably always come out contributing the Mel Brown sound you know, in, in whatever genre he was working on. I don't know how one does that. I, you know, I think most musicians would strive to have your own sound and very few do. But you, know, you could hear that one note by Mel and you know it's Mel Brown. He was, he didn't want to be, it seemed like to me he, he didn't really want to be big. You know, he, he kind of liked the, the place where he was, the community and the people. So, because he, he could have been touring all over the world, huge. But he chose to just make Kitchener his home and, and uh, he liked the people around him. Uh, so he was a, like a humble guy. I base everything I do. It's like, it's that nucleus of everything I think of in my heart or in my mind. It just, it goes back to Mel Brown. He's, he's the guy I look to, you know, for inspiration. He was um, really quiet and humble. And at the same time, a monster guitar player, you know. And back in the day when he, you know, stood up played and stuck his chest out and had this, you know, really mellow grin on his face. He, he could do no wrong. He really could. It was, he was always inspiring. You know, he was a very quiet man, a man of very, very few words. But uh, in this community, he's built a strong musician's community, he's built a strong audience community, and he's built a strong cultural community. This is a guy who could have been more of a front man and played bigger venues. You know, he loved a funky little venue full of good people that loved the blues. And he would just weave his magic in there and everybody would go home at the end of the night going, man, I am never going to forget how good this was. And then he would do it again the next night. There was a feeling when you were around him that it was special. Like, and when you went and saw him play, you knew something special was happening here. And and we were, and we felt lucky. Like we knew, wow, we were so lucky here in KW to have this guy. And why is he here? Well, I think it's just fantastic that uh, that Mel's 
legacy is continuing because it is an inspiration for so many young musicians, uh, not even young musicians, I mean we all continue to push the blues based on things that he set forward for us here in the community. We had him play on this track and um, at the end we were all finished and he was packing up his guitar case and we were all just standing and watching him like still amazed at him, wow. And, um, and we gave him a check and he looked at the check for a long time, really serious, and then he looked at us and said, hell, if, I, hell, if I'd known you was paying me, I would have played better. <laughs> he didn't know we were going we to pay him. Yeah. At that moment, it hit me that he didn't even think he was going to get paid. He just came and did this for fun, to be nice, and that was amazing, you know. Bringing a man from Mississippi up way up north, you know, and, and, the, and the people in the surrounding area just embraced him like he was born here. You know, since we've been up here, and I've learned how Kitchener in Canada loved him. Mel, I think, identified with the fact that he was suddenly free. When he got to Kitchener Loo, he was loved, he was respected, and I think possibly that was the first time he really, to that depth, felt that in his whole life. You know, he had been the, the baddest motherfucker in the world his whole career, but he had never felt, I don't think, that love of, or that, that level of admiration ever before. And that's why he went, I'm staying here. Because you see, black people could come to that community and be free. The most remarkable thing that he ever told me was what the blues was. And, uh, this was one of the first times that we hung out. I was driving him to Toronto to go play at the Black Swan, and I think he was feeling me out on things. And so we were driving in my Olds 98, and he says, you know what the blues is, Leo? And I gave him my university studied account of, yes, Mel, I understand that the blues was the turning around of the dominant seventh chord uh, to tonic function and right around the time of the Civil War after the disbanding of all the southern armies and they picked up all the instruments in the fields and started playing them and then we start getting the genesis of, of uh, the black American experience through music and he looks at me and says, no that ain't it Leo, blues came from this. Oh, 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 and I almost drove off the fucking road and I had, like I was walling up, I said, really? He says, that's all it is, Leo. And uh, I got pretty quiet, for... but it was true. He was a really sweet, caring guy that had his ears to the ground. Just because he didn't say much doesn't mean that this wasn't a guy who was in tune and dialed in to what was happening in his surrounding. Like, if I ever knew a guy with a plan, that was a guy with a plan. You know, he, that, was a, that was a very strategic player. Like, to, to, to choose to retire in Canada, Kitchener-Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, uh, was a strategic plan where he knew that he'd be free for the rest of his life, and he, could, and he knew how much time he had left, and that he could just gracefully roll out the next 20 to 25 years of his life and enjoy it, you know, and, and be loved. Like, wow, what an ending. What more could you ask for? Mel was diagnosed in 1998 with emphysema, 
Mel continued to record and perform live with the aid of an oxygen tank. I've been loving you. Too long. I don't want to stop you now. Baby. You gon' talk. And you want to be free, baby. My love is strong up, baby. You become a habit to me. I've been loving you. Too long. You're welcome to dance. I don't want to stop now, baby. gave something to him that he couldn't find anywhere else and in return he gifted us with his life and you know that's why he didn't hide from us when he became ill and he played right to the end because he knew that we were family you know and I think that anyone that was in his condition towards the end might have not wanted to come out in that way. But we were family. That was his community. And he could be that way in front of us in that condition. And um, he knew that he was loved because we had seen him at his best. You know, and I think at times he really turned it on for us. You know, and, and, and intentionally, and I don't think Mel Brown always did that, even when maybe he might have been with Bobby Bland and stuff like that, because he had learned, I think, to be excellent when it was necessary or when it was required or at the right moment, you know? And I think in Kitchener Lou, as the leader of the Homewreckers house band, he just, he just gifted us. Oh, baby. a good way to tell a story, you know, you tell a story and uh, without talking so much you can speak with your guitar or your music, I think, you know. And I enjoy uh, communicating with people that way, you know. I enjoy uh, my music. Uh, I like to talk to people with my music. I think I speak well with people. And um, I just enjoy the sound. You know, I enjoy uh, uh, putting things together, you know, the, the stories together. Just like writing and you know, reading a book, you know, you just. You make a story out of your music. 
In the winter of 2009, Mel was admitted to the hospital for the last time. I was, I was fortunate enough that I actually had a chance to go into the hospital and get a chance to say goodbye to Mel. And uh, he, was in, he was in ICU there and uh, I could tell that you know, he was really, really not doing very well. And uh, so I just, you know, sat there with him and, and, and held his hand. And although he was really struggling, I know that he knows that I was there. I, I could see he was looking at me. And uh, Mel had told me a long time ago when I was, I had a, a record deal and I was doing a bunch of stuff and he was seeing my video on TV and stuff. He said to me, uh, I came to see him and he said, I thought you would have bought me a Cadillac by now. <laughs> so that night when I was sitting in the hospital with him, I said, hey Mel, remember you told me you thought I'd buy you a Cadillac by now? You gotta give me some more time. <laughs> so that was just kind of a little, uh, a little funny thing between us there, but uh, he uh, unfortunately, you know, they, uh, he just ran out of time too early, I think. One song he has in particular, he said, don't tell my father, don't say it, don't tell me. I admire that in his music, he was talking about his past life and the life that he enjoyed and that he didn't want nobody to share no tears because he had lived a full life, even though he died a young man. I, uh, I didn't get to say goodbye to him because I was, uh, I was out of town and uh, he kind of, uh, we were, had been in touch in this last year or so. And, but I got a phone call from Scott Urquhart and uh, I was too far away to come home. And uh, I sat by the phone for a night and waited for the bad news. So, uh, that was hard. It was hard to see Mel's decline because, you know, I had been through my own health issues and. I didn't want to see anybody ever suffer in any way. And Mel was so important. So I guess the lesson there is that you must appreciate what you have while it's there. And the fact that we're here almost three years later talking about him must mean that he went right into the bone marrow. Huh. All right. He was supposed to be opening for Mavis Staples. And I was supposed to, uh, I guess, be like the opening to the opening or something like that. So we came, and he was hanging on. He wanted to do that gig really badly. And, but he was too ill, and uh, we came to the hospital that morning to visit him. And we got there 10 minutes too late. He was dead. We have a sad announcement to make. Uh, Mel Brown passed away peacefully this afternoon around 4.30 at St. Mary's Hospital. Um, I'd like to get Andrew Galloway. Andrew is the president and founder of Electrify Records. Uh, Mel was on Andrew's label and I'd like to get Andrew to say a few words about Mel. Words really fail me at this point other than Mel was such a wonderful guy, which you all know, a unique individual, and he crammed at least 10 lifetimes into the one lifetime he was given and he gave so much to so many people. So we'd just like to dedicate this evening's performance to the memory of Mel Brown. Thank you very much. Our dear friend Mel, you moved on up a little higher. Yeah, you jamming up in heaven now. He and Pops and Albert King and all them guys. Yeah. Having a good old time. Yeah. yeah. So we didn't miss him, but we have such Wonderful memories, such beautiful musical memories. Mel, we're going to miss you and we're going to see you one day, by and by. We'll see you again. We love you, Mel. Friends and loved ones, as you come today, I want you to look down memory lane and just think about how long God allowed your loved one to stay with you. Yes, when you think about it, God allowed him to stay here 69 years. And I tell you, that's a long time to be upon planet Earth. It's a long time to get up and beat on your guitar. 
is a long time to go in and out. 69 years. And I know when you look at it, you see six and then nine. I tell you, it was 69 Christmas, 69 New Year, 69 Easter, 69 Thanksgiving, 69 4th of July, 69 Memorial Day, long time, 69 winter, 69 spring, 69 summer, 69 fall, long time. God allowed him to stay here a long time. Mm -hmm. So then, let us thank the Lord for allowing him to be with us a long time. Mm -hmm. Think about the joy that he shared with us and shared with this world. Hold on. Mm -hmm. When my world down. And the race, and the race have been won. And the master called our servant, me, me home. I will heal his welcome voice. my best friend, my lover, my husband, my father, my uncle. He was everything to me. So it was pretty muddled for me for a couple of years there. But I feel a little better now. I still miss him. And that will never change, I'm sure, because he's gone forever. I had all these messages from all the cemeteries. Everybody wanted to um, have mail, you know, in their cemetery. But the guy they had working at this place here, he left the message and he said, tell Miss Angel if she needs a space in the cemetery, I have one for her and it's free. So he's right here and the idea was to have him near the highway because he was a traveling man. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
sky is crying. Look at the tears that roll down the street. I'm waiting in mud, trying to find my baby. I wonder what in the world can she be. I saw my baby yesterday morning And she was walking on down Won't you come on home? 